This is a conference uh, that we've put together uh, over at MIT Center for Civic Media along with our friends over at EFF. And EFF has helped us reach out uh, to an amazing group of student activists. I had a chance to, to start meeting with some of that group last night. And where we're really trying to go with this conference is to figure out what set of issues we might be able to make progress on around this general theme of freedom to innovate. So a lot of times when you stand up to organize a conference, you actually have a sense for here's the issue, here's exactly what we want to be working on, let's rally everybody to it. That is not this conference. This is a conference about figuring out who we are as a group, who we are as a field, what we might be able to do together. This is a conference that in many ways comes out of events that in many cases have unfolded on campuses all over the country, campuses all over the world, and particularly on this campus uh, where we've had real interesting issues as far as people getting in trouble with freedom to innovate. As we were putting this event together, uh, we had the really interesting uh, example of Ahmed Mohammed, uh, a 14-year-old student in Texas who brought in pieces of a digital clock that he was trying to make into a different digital clock, found himself detained by his school who was afraid that he was a bomb maker. And while this was clearly an example of Islamophobia, it's also an example of the challenges we have when people end up breaking the rules in order to try to make something new uh, and something creative. And so as we're coming together for this, we're really thinking about how do we as activists, as hackers, how do we challenge and ensure that people have this right to innovate? And this is something that's been brought up not just by Ahmed Mohammed, but by cases that didn't get an immediate outpouring of having the White House invite a young man to come in, uh, having Facebook invite someone to come have an internship, having MIT more or less roll out the welcome mat and say that we'd love to have you as a student, because that's not what happened for Jeremy Rubin. That's not what happened for Star Simpson. That's not what happened for Aaron Swartz. And we want to try to figure out how we as a group and how we as a movement can come together, identify the laws, identify the issues, identify the institutions where we may want to, as activists, get together and fight for change. So we don't know entirely where we are going, but we have brought some amazing guides and navigators here. And before I introduce the first one who's going to take the stage, I just want to thank a couple of the people who've made this possible. First of all, we're sitting here in these seats. We've got AV behind it. We've got breakfast. We've got food throughout the day. And that is thanks to our friends over at the Ford Foundation who made a bet on this. They are sponsoring this conference. They are paying for it. So I want to thank uh, the folks from Ford who've made this possible. I want to thank the people who've organized it. We've had a amazing help from our friends uh, over at EFF. We've had great help from folks over at Center for Civic Media, uh, particularly Nathan Matias, Laurie Lejeune, who are both here. Nathan's going to be speaking later this afternoon, along with Kate Darling, who's been part of our team sort of putting this all together. And we've also had fantastic support uh, from the MIT Media Lab, and specifically from the director, Joey Ito, who is someone who cares deeply and passionately about these issues, someone who has been early on every time we have had a case where someone in the media lab has gotten in trouble uh, around these questions of innovation and putting technology out in the world. So I wanted to invite Joey to be our first speaker to the stage to talk about the ways in which innovation is both a challenge and opportunity for institutions like MIT. So with no further ado on that, please welcome Joey Ito. Thank you, Ethan. I guess Hal's been here much longer than I am, but I'm probably more institutionally administrative than he is. So I, I, I will, I don't speak on behalf of the administration, but I, I think I'm somewhat representative. Um, I'm gonna leave this for people who wanna see it. This is the marketing and actually the ethos of a lot of MIT. This is called Nightworks. It's the history of hacks and pranks at MIT by the Institute Historian. And um, you know, MIT is, uh, is built on sort of this idea that we, we hack things. And um, I think what's interesting is at MIT, you have a bunch of different ecosystems. And, and obviously, there are people in the administration who probably don't agree with this. But I think that the faculty um, and the students um, believe that, that um, the freedom to innovate is a really important it's thing. Um, Just and to record it. And if you want to one of, my, one of the, the um, interesting 
parts about MIT is because MIT is a somewhat engineering-driven school, our president and our provost are both engineers, um, and last week's um, big conference was called Solve. Um, it's interesting because this institute tends to try to solve for things. And as you know, when you're trying to write algorithms to solve for things, you can get stuck in local maximums or local minimums, whichever way you're, you're, you're graphing. And one of the problems with always trying to solve the solution as quickly as possible is you can get stuck. And one of the things you can get stuck around is the idea that you should, it's easier just to follow the rules. And I think what's important as you start to think about how do you actually push out of a local maximum, and this is also kind of why you need scientists and artists in addition to the designers and engineers, is you need to actually imagine and push the edges. And I think what's important um, is this ability to go outside of this, the structure. I, I have these nine principles that I have on my wall, and one of them is disobedience over compliance. And, um, and actually, the other day, the general counsel was in my office, and he raised his eyebrow and said, what does that mean? And I said, well, it's pretty straightforward. It means that you don't get a Nobel Prize for doing what you're told. You do get a Nobel Prize for questioning authority and thinking for yourself and taking risk. And in fact, I'm working on a prize that I want to make at the Media Lab. There's a, there's a famous prize, and now I forgot the name of it, but I think it's, it's, it's actually slightly mythological, but it was the Austrian um, Emperor's Prize that um, it was allegedly given to people who disobeyed direct orders on the battlefield but turned out to be right. You know, so it's a high-risk prize to try to get, but if you get it, it's pretty cool. Um, but I think, I think that's kind of what science is like, right? Because you take a lot of risk when you come up with a thesis or you write a paper that overturns an assumption that all of your authorities are doing. So that's kind of what we're doing when we're pressing against laws, right? So, so if you're pushing against a law that you don't think is right, you've got your sort of, the cards are stacked against you. But I think it's, but it's really important. So one of the things that, um, I'm gonna pivot for a second. I want to also just thank of Ethan, who, who else was involved? It's Kate, um, Nathan, um, Jeremy, and probably a bunch of other people. Who, Earhart. Um, we, we, we now have this um, law clinic that we set up with BU. Um, I think this c came out of all of the discussions that, um, that Ethan just ha made, had, but, um, but the idea was how can you get, and I think Tidbit was the, the easiest case, is, which is Jeremy didn't know where to go. MIT can't represent Jeremy because, um, and, and I think EFF was great for having stepped in, but, but, the, but the idea is where should a student go for help? And so we now have this deal with the um, BU Law Clinic, which with Kate's very involved in, where, where they are now um, able to help our students. It almost fell off into the wrong course because it turned into a, a, a clinic for startup entrepreneurs that wanted help setting up companies. We said, no, 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 the original idea was to help with CFAA and DMC and other things. It's sort of back on course and we've got that. And I think that's a, a great, um, and, and, and the good news is that the, the central administration are very happy with our activity on this. I know I think when Nathan and others wrote letters to the administration, at first it kind of got them up um, got them a little excited, but then the outcome was that they realized that we had set up a, a structure that's very good for the institute, makes us look good. Um, and I'm, actually, I have to. Pay, they ended up sticking me with a bill for the director of the BU side because they said um, the media lab is the ground zero for these kinds of problems. And 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 to me, that's a good thing because that means we are the cutting edge of this freedom to innovate movement, which I think is super important. Um, this will sound a little bit boastful, and it is, but uh, um, day, after, day before yesterday I was in the White House um, having lunch with President Obama, and I was talking to him about this conference, and it was interesting because it was me, President, and then like four staff, and the four staff were Alex McGivery, who all of you know, he's a Berkman guy, he's totally one of us. Um, this other guy named Jason Goldman, who some of you may know, he was the first CTO at Blogger, at Twitter, he was the druid in my World of Warcraft guild, which is the main way I know him, his a AKA gold toe. Um, so he's now in charge of the digital. He's actually the one who, who beat us on the Ahmed thing because you, we were like sitting around trying to figure out should the Media Lab do anything, should the Media Lab do anything, and President Obama's on, on video inviting, uh, saying, oh, that's a cool clock on Twitter. And so he's, he's, that's what he's in charge of, is making the president more nimble on responding to these things in the Media Lab. And then. And then we have Megan Smith, who's also a former media lab, she's a CTO, and, 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 and Marky was there who did fix, un, un fucked up healthcare.gov. And so what, what's interesting is right now, you have a smart president with all the staff in the White House are all kind of part of our gang, and they all get this 
problem deeply. And so to me, it feels like what I walked away from was that the iron is very hot. And also, I think, I think this is okay to talk about, but the, they, they move the national security people right next to the OSTP people. So they're constantly running into the security people in the hallways, having interesting hallway conversation. And they're also, like for instance, I, I guess I probably shouldn't say this one, so can we take this one off the record? But I think it's okay, but, but I mean, it's, it's okay to record it. It's not that big a deal, but I don't think we should put uh, So So one of the things that we discussed with the president was that we would try to figure out a few actionable things to do while he's still in office, and then we've got Team White House on our side. So one of the outputs I'd like to have, because we talked about freedom to innovate as at least one chunk of those things, are things that we might imagine the White House being able to do that could help. So that would be one of the things. and then. And then, we, I was talking about this with Hal, but is there a way that that affects MIT and nudges the balance at MIT so that we have more representation on the sort of the, 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 the hacker side? So, I, so I, I think we're gonna have some great conversations here, but for me, if I can have some actionable output, I will um, deliver it to the White House and to our, our administration here at MIT. Thanks. Thanks so much, Joey. Um, so just a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, it's fantastic for us who are here at the Media Lab to have someone um, who is running the Media Lab who is actively conspiring and trying to help us think about how we make change around this field. Um, Joey thanked a lot of people uh, in talking about the actions that we were able to take here at MIT uh, in, in the wake of Jeremy Rubin's case. Jeremy is going to speak later today about that case. Uh, later today, we're also going to have Nathan Matias and Kate Darling, uh, who've been working on that BU clinic, talk about what we did and talk about how it might be a model for somewhere else. I, I just want to explicitly thank Hal Abelson, uh, who was uh, an incredible uh, support and resource uh, as we tried to figure out different responses to that uh, and took his great authority and great experience uh, and really stood up for what was right in that case. So I just wanted to, to thank Hal explicitly on that. Um